In this video, we are going to talk to you about the test of independence, which is also known as a contingency table chi-squared test. The contingency table chi-squared test is used when you have two categorical variables. Um, each categorical variable has different trait states, and the data are the counts of the numbers of subjects. The question that you're as answering with this test is, is there an association between these two variables? And let me show you uh, a couple of examples of the kinds of data that you can um, test with a contingency table chi-squared test. And this is one example. Um, this is an example from ecology where I have two species. Let's say there are two species of birds um, and I have three different types of seeds and I want to know how many individuals of each species of birds prefer each type of seed. So I set up a choice experiment. I observed individuals from species 1 and species 2, which seeds they prefer to feed on, and the numbers in the cells represent counts. So for example, there were five birds of species 1 that ate seed type 1. There were 20 birds of species 1 that ate seed type 2, and so on and so forth. This is a 3 by 2 table. You can do other size tables. Here's an example from a genetics problem where you would have a uh, two by two table. So I have genotype, it's got trait state one, trait state two. And I've got phenotype, it's got trait state one, trait state two. And I have 40 individuals that are genotype one and also show phenotype one. 40 individuals, or 50 individuals rather, that are genotype two and phenotype two. It's important to remember here that what we have are different trait states. So for example, genotype 1 might be somebody who's homozygous for one allele. Genotype 2 might be somebody who's homozygous for a different allele. Phenotype 1 might be somebody who can taste PTC. Phenotype 2 would be a non-taster. So they're not independent genotypes and phenotypes here. All right, so what can I do with these types of data? Well. Before I do this, I need to t remind you that it's a statistical test, so there is a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the state of each subject at variable 1 is independent of that subject state at variable 2. There are some assumptions that we have to take um, into account for this test. One is that each observation has to be independent. That is, you evaluate it once per subject. You can't do repeated measures with this. Secondly, each expected count must be one or higher. And thirdly, no more than 20% of the expected counts can be less than five. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to say that you have an expected count? The chi-squared formula has the numbers of uh, individuals of each trait state as the observed values. Then you use the null hypothesis to calculate what you expect to see based on the number of individuals that you measure for each trait state. Um, then you use this formula where you take each observed value, subtract from it the expected values, square that quantity, divide by the expected, and sum all of those up, and that will give you something called the chi-squared value. You then test the chi-squared value against a table value, and you can then determine whether or not your two characteristics are independent of each other. Well, let's see how this works. So again, here's my null hypothesis that the state of each subject in variable 1 is independent of its state of variable 2. And in this case, I'm asking is phenotype independent of genotype. And here are my observed data. What I'm going to do with these observed data is use Excel to do the calculations to get through that formula. So let me get to Excel. You'll notice here in my Excel table that I've got genotype 1 and genotype 2, phenotype 1, phenotype 2, and I've got these colored boxes that are currently empty. What I'm going to put into these colored boxes are the row and column totals for the respective rows and columns. So equal sum, and I'm going to sum up this row total, or rather to get this column total, and I'm going to click in this box and drag and fill so that I've now got my two column totals. Same thing with the row total, equals sum, highlight my rows, and I can drag down, 
I've got my two row totals. Now I'm going to get the total total, which is the total number of subjects in my study. And I just highlight all of that. And there's my total totals. So I'm just going to, for ease of visualization, make those centered. And these are my observed data. Now what I'm going to do with my observed data is I'm going to highlight all of this. I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to paste. And then I'm going to take out my observations. So I'm just going to go up here to clear. I'm going to clear the contents. And now what I can do is change this to expected and use the same sort of table for the expected values. Well, here's the logic behind calculating the expected values. I have my row and column totals. What I'm then going to do is say, if my null hypothesis is correct and the value of the number of individuals in this cell is independent or, or phenotype one is independent, phenotype is independent of genotype, then the value of the numbers in this sh cell should reflect the number of individuals who are genotype one and the number of individuals who are genotype two, weighted by the total number of individuals that I uh, cal calculated data on. So what I can do is take the row total, which here is 45, multiply it by the column total, here is 60, and then divide that product by the total total, 115. So I have the row total times the column total divided by the total total, and that equals this value here, 23.4782609. So what I can do is get Excel to help me with that calculation. So I'm going to click in this cell, equals, I have to come up here to get my row total times, or column total rather, times the row total. And then just for completeness sake, I'm going to put these in parentheses because I want that multiplication done first, divided by the total total. There we are, 23478260. Now, it would be very convenient if we could drag and fill this formula. Unfortunately, we can't, because the way I've entered this formula, I'm using relative cell references. So that means what I have to do in order to get the same formula in this square, in this box, is to, again, do the equal sign, and again, click on the appropriate values correct row and column totals, and that, and I've got that value. Now it is possible if you use absolute cell references to do this, to set the, it up in the one square and then do the drag and fill. Um, and if you feel comfortable with Excel and you want to tackle using relative um, or absolute cell values rather than relative cell values, take a look at that video and that will walk you through the process of doing that. I'm just going to, for simplicity's sake, not try and do that right now. I'm just going to keep working here. So I've got my column total times my row total. Put in my parentheses. It's important to remember to go up to the observed data when you do this. Don't try to do it with the um, expected values. There we go. And I can check that I've got this set up correctly by looking to see whether or not my row and column totals are the same values in my expected table as they are in my observed table. They should be. And they are, so I know I've entered my formulas correctly. Now what I'm going to do is again paste a copy of that table in there. I'm going to 
remove my values, clear those out. And actually, I don't need these column totals, so just to make my um, uh, table look a little bit more clear, I'm going to get rid of these column and row totals. I'm going to save this one here. And what I'm now do, going to do is actually set up a table to help me calculate the chi-squared. So this table is going to be my observed minus my expected squared. And then I'm going to divide that all by the expected. So I enter my first cell, equal sign. I'm going to take my observed value minus the expected value. Again, put my parentheses around that. I'm going to square that quantity, and then I'm going to divide by the expected value, and I get a number. Now this time, I actually can drag and fill. So I'm going to drag down here, and then highlight these two, and fill. And I want to verify that I've done this correctly, so I'm going to double click in this cell, and it tells me um, I've got phenotype, the, the observed value for phenotype 2, genotype 1, minus the expected value, divide it by the expected value, so my values are correct. Um, I could check for each cell, but I know that if I'm correct for the one, I should be correct for the other. I'm going to then type equals, sum, and I'm going to sum up these values. And this is my chi-squared value, 39.9374699. Now, what do I do with this? Well, I can treat this very similarly as the way I did t-test values, which is that people who have more time than I have have figured out how big the chi-squared value has to be for me to say that these things, for me to accept or reject the null hypothesis. Um, so I'm going to go back here to my PowerPoint go to this slide. So here's my chi-squared observed value. It's written, the sim it's symbolized with the Greek chi squared observed. So 39.937. I'm going to take it, round it at three decimal places because that's what my table expresses it at. Again, to use the table, I need to know something about the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom for this test is the number of rows in my table minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. Here's the symbolic way to write that. And for this 2 by 2 table, that means that my degrees of freedom is 1. Tailedness is not an issue here. You don't have to consider tailedness when you uh, calculate a chi-squared test. If I look at the table in the lab manual, the chi-squared value for uh, deg zero, degrees of freedom 1 at 0 0.05 is 3.841. And if my chi-squared observed is less than my chi-squared critical, I'm going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if my chi-squared observed is greater than my chi-squared critical, then I will reject the null hypothesis. My observed value is greater than my uh, critical value, and so I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. And on the basis of, the, on the basis of this, I'm able to conclude that phenotype um, your state at um, your trait state at the phenotype is not independent of your trait state at the genotype. In other words, there's an association between genotype and phenotype. Well, let's actually go back and look at the data. If we look at the observed data here, it's pretty obvious that individuals that are genotype one tend to have phenotype one, and individuals who are genotype two tend to have phenotype two. I can get that from the data, but now I know. Um, with some statistical certainty that, these, that this is a significant relationship between genotype and phenotype. Um, Chi-squared tests can be done, as I said, for multiple size tables. Um, this is a 2x2, two two. you can do a 3x2, 4x2, 4x3, 3x3. It's actually relatively easy to set up. One of the things I have done for myself is I've set up an Excel file 
where I've set up various kinds of uh, chi-squareds for um, different sized tables. And then when I need to run a chi-squared analysis, um, I can just plug in the observed values and Excel will do automatically do all the calculations for the chi-squared of that size. So if you find that you may be doing or think you may be doing a lot of chi-squared uh, contingency table chi-squared type analyses, that's something that you might want to do. All right, that concludes this video. Happy chi-squaring!